Hello. Hello. And welcome to another fabulous episode of Bubbles for Your Troubles, brought to you by Champagne Friday. Today, we're going on a little bit more of a special journey. Mm -hmm. Today, we actually wanted to talk to you about a few things. Number one, we've been getting questions around kind of the different types of bubbly that are out there. Um, so just giving a little bit more context as to, you know, what you can find. Um, so we're going to be talking Cremant today, mm -hmm. but what's the best part is we're going to be talking about a really, really special region where you can find Cremant. Yeah, we're going to be, uh, we're going to be in France. We're going to be tasting wines from the Jura and the Jura is not a region that a lot of people are familiar with. It's very small production. Once upon a time, it was very large, but now very small. Uh, and we're going to be tasting a very special producer who not only doesn't produce a lot of wine, but his wines sell out almost instantly. Uh, so we have two bottlings from him. Uh, very, very, very special. I'm very excited to try. So. And because these bottles are so special, we're actually going to taste them in a very special area as well. In a little piece of paradise that I like to call the Chateau Rideau Escape. So. Let's go. We have arrived at a little slice of paradise. <laughs> yes, we are still in Calgary. It's hard to believe. Um, but I wanted to be able to shoot this in a very special area because the Jura. It's a very special area. Oh. Yeah. It act absolutely is. Um, so yeah, we're gonna be we're gonna be trying two wines from uh, Stefan Tissot from the region called the Jura. Uh, this is in the eastern part of France, just slightly south, and basically fifty miles away from Burgundy. And there's only it's only eighty kilometers. Mm -hmm. It's so tiny. It's the size of this back lot, pretty much. <laughs> it's incredibly tiny. small. Yeah, actually. You know, you could draw a comparison that the size of the, the area of the Jura is your entire complex on the scale of Calgary. So it's, it's very, 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 very small. Mm -hmm. uh, and, you know, very special because it used to produce a lot of wine. Uh, I think now there's about 10% of what used to be under vine is under vine now. So they're making very, very, very little wine. And as I mentioned in the introduction, uh, Tiso wines are very, very, very small, but also very hard to get. They're in extremely high demand. Um, we get very small allocations. So it's actually a pleasure to be able to taste these because of the two Cremonts we're gonna try today, only 60 bottles of each came this year. So yeah, this is a large chunk of the, uh, of the stock is gonna go, gonna go into glasses right now. Right now. <laughs> Ooh, the sound of success. <laughs> also, we are not allowed drinks or glass in this area. Mm -hmm. Please do not tell the pool warden. So I'll let you get Ooh. a little nose in there first. So we're going to start with his regular label, Cremant de Jura. Uh, this is a proper Cremant de Jura in the sense that Cremant is generally referring to any French sparkling wine that isn't champagne. You heard like Cremant de Bourgogne, you know, Cremant de Languedoc, just basically the larger area with Cremant. Cremant meaning sparkling. So Cremant is pretty much champagne. It's made in the same way, but just not in champagne region. Yeah. So okay. my, my experience, I've never run into a Cremant that wasn't uh, fermented in the bottle uh, like champagne. So that'd be the big sort of similarity you're looking for. Usually it's a, it's a qualitative uh, indicator, right? Like if you've got bottle fermented wines or bottle conditioned wines, they're usually a little better. So there. why is Cremant the ugly stepchild? Like you never hear someone go, Hey, I'm going to bring a bottle of Cremant to the party or, Oh, I'd love to bring a bottle of Cremant to your baby's christening. Yeah. Well, and you know, it's, 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 it's kind of like Prosecco. Um, people's right. introduction to these wines are generally as a inexpensive alternative to the, the celebration or the, you know, uh, the, the idea of champagne being something very special, which it is. Um, but I mean, you're going to see in the case of these, this is very special. It's this super is very production. special. It's, and it's... we're sharing our secrets with you guys. <laughs> so when you show up to the next bar mitzvah with a Cremant from Jura, you're going to look like a superhero. I think so, yeah. And I think there's a lot to be said for, for not getting stuck in the idea that only champagne is, is special or is worth a little bit of extra money. Uh, so we'll, we'll find out what you think about this. Okay. Cheers. Cheers. Ooh. 
Oh, I didn't even taste it yet. It was. <laughs> well, no, I was gonna say the nose. The nose is like a good medium. It's classic pear, apple. Mm -hmm. There's like a little bit of sweeter stone fruit, but not sweet at all. This is zero residual sugar, so it's an extra brute. Um, what else can we say about this? So it does. It doesn't have that like toastiness that you get from a champagne, but I will say that like it still has this like really nice. It's got a really beautiful palette. It definitely doesn't remind me of Prosecco. No. We know how much I love Prosecco. <laughs> We're gonna change that. We're gonna find a Prosecco that you love. Um, so yeah, this is this is fermented in the bottle exactly like champagne. But what's interesting about this is a Cremant de Europe. We think about champagne. We, we know for the most part, most of us know Chardonnay, Pinot Noir, Pinot Meunier are the three main grapes. Mm -hmm. In the Jura, they grow Chardonnay and they grow Pinot Noir. Uh, but they also grow something called Poulsard and another red grape called Trousseau. Which is my favorite grape of all time. Well, we'll have to get into one of his red wines off camera just so you can, yes. you can try some of yeah. his, uh, his Poulsard and Trousseau. Uh, so it's a proper Cremant de Jura and there is also a small percentage of indigenous grapes that you don't really mm. see in any other sparkling wine, the Poulsard and the Trousseau. Uh, in this case it's only about 5% each but he wanted to make sure that it was a proper representation right. of Jura having all those grapes involved. Well, now let's get down to business. Mm -hmm. Price. So this guy just arrived in market, and as I said, we only got 60 bottles, um, and it is from a very prestigious producer. You expect to have a, a pretty high price. This would be about, I want to say, about 45 bucks okay. retail. Okay. So pretty, pretty reasonable in, okay. in, in the, the realm of like quality sparkling wines, bottle fermented, yep. etc. See, for 45 dollars you can really just feel like you are maxing and relaxing mm -hmm. in this little slice of paradise. I really love the texture of this. It's not too heavy. You, you mentioned it's not like yeasty or yeah. like super bready. The fruit is really clear. There's a little bit of like a dry toast kind of like thing, but 12 months in bottle on lease, so it's not gonna be really super rich and mm -hmm. like some of the yeah. other champagnes that you see. Uh, so yeah, this will work in the fresh style for sure. This would be like great sushi. Oh, speaking of food pairings, I also heard that the Jura is known for making excellent cheese, such as Comte. Yes, absolutely. If you're looking for a Jura pairing, whether it's a still wine, a sparkling wine, whatever, Comte. In fact, one of the most famous sort of food and wine pairings, uh, certainly regional, would be Comte with the very strange sort of uh, wine that the Jura makes. Um, it's called it's called Vinjon or yellow wine, paired with very old Comte, absolutely outstanding, it's beautiful. A very good friend of mine told me that whenever you are wanting to pair something with a wine, the saying is, where it grows, it goes. Absolutely, yeah. You don't have to think too much about, about classic food pairings with classic dishes. Yeah. You know, when you think about Tuscany and you think about like things like Bolognese or like wild boar is, is pretty common there, of course Sangiovese is gonna do the trick. The same with with champagne. You think about like cooler climate foods. You think about I actually really like oysters, even though that's not necessarily that region. But absolutely, if there's a local food and a local wine, you're going to be very hard pressed to to make a bad pairing. Well, we're just going to enjoy the rest of this delicious cremant and work on our tan. Oh, just really had to get in here and take a dip. It's so hot. Plus, we're being blessed mm -hmm. with this lovely little nugget. Yeah, this is uh, this is Tissot's BBF. Uh, BBF stands for Blanc de Blanc en Fut, uh, which mm. the Fut refers to being barrel aged wines. So I thought it meant best buds forever, Andrew. Well, I mean, <laughs> that works too, I guess. Yeah. Best bubbly friends. <laughs> Forever. Okay, so this is interesting because this is from the same producer that we just tasted from the last time. Um, and I really want to find out because when, sometimes when you go to Vine Arts, you see a Cremant, you see it from the same producer, but they're totally different prices. So let's figure out, you know, why it would be more expensive and if yeah. it's worth spending a little bit more. Absolutely. Okay, so. The last wine we tried was was a blend of Pinot Noir, Chardonnay, and as I mentioned, a small amount of Poussard and Pousseau. This is Blanc de Blanc, so this is 100% Chardonnay, or Blanc de Blanc, white from white, uh, only using the white grapes, so in this case, 100% Chardonnay. 
the Unflut, I mentioned the barrel aging, so aging wine in barrels cost more. It takes more mm. time if you're using new barrels and you're going for that kind of like toasty, like richness of those barrels, it's gonna cost a little more. Mm. What else we have going on with this one? Both of them are aged in the bottle. The first wine was only aged for 12 months in bottle before release and disgorgement. Uh, this particular label gets four years, so minimum 48 months before disgorgement uh, and, and being available to the market. Uh, outside of that, I mean, like that, that, that actually is the biggest factor. So time and barrels. Time, barrel, and effort, because you yeah. know, when you're letting it sit that long, you really don't know what's gonna happen. When you're making a natural wine, leaving a wine that long, without any sort of like sulfur or additions to preserve it, you're taking a bit of a risk. But So does this say the year on it, like how do you know it takes four years? Do you just have to have your brain with you knowing it took four this, years? This is this is not like, yeah, it's not a, a legal uh, requirement, like oh, in some okay. cases, like okay. champagne or like Grand Reservas, et cetera, and, and still wines. It's not a requirement. Um, thankfully, this one at least says it on the label. A lot of them don't. Okay. Um, so this is where not all Cremants are created equal. You'll see one for sixteen ninety nine, and you'll mm -hmm. see this one for about, I would say about 69 70 bucks retail probably. Um, but one of them makes, you know, 100,000 bottles and one of them makes 4,000 bottles. One of them ages for six months in bottle, one of them ages for four years. Mm. So it makes a big difference, that time, effort, and certainly quality. Um, so hopefully, hopefully this... Well, well let's try it. Cheers. Cheers. Oh, Ooh. So you can see actually maybe... Oh, this is a lovely. a lot deeper in color. It should be a lot richer yeah. than, on the nose. This is much richer. It definitely has more of like a champagne quality on the nose. Mm. So there's also like a slightly Ooh. like nutty, toasty, buttery thing. It's, um, I wouldn't say these, these wines are oxidative. In fact, yeah. he makes a lot of his wines in the non-oxidative fashion. So mm -hmm. they should be really bright and rich. All that's coming from the least contact. So we talked mm -hmm. about the cheese. Mm -hmm. Sometimes when people smell wines that are like very very um lees heavy they spend a lot of time on their on their sediment you get this like cheese rind kind of richness it's really like quite lovely if it's done right this is luxury within luxury mm -hmm. i said so and what's interesting is the price of this would be the same price as a bottle of Veuve Clicquot, mm -hmm. but it's much more interesting a little bit yeah. weirder and i think if you're wanting if you're going maybe to a pool party with some discerning guests you would wow them more with this than with a bottle of both absolutely i mean just the, the the sort of like niche factor of this um the area being very 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 small champagne's getting larger the jura is getting smaller yes um and also just qualitatively i think this actually swings way above its price point like if i was buying this for a hundred dollars retail i'd still be very happy and it has so much complexity on Mm. on the nose and palate with that that seriously nutty buttery like mm -hmm. almost like cooked almonds kind of thing it's very beautiful yeah delicious yeah. that brings this episode to a wrap but we always want to make sure we're leaving you with some tasty little tidbits that you can wow your guests with when you're bringing bottles so andrew with cremant mm -hmm. if i brought a bottle of cremant to the party what's something i can tell my guests that's really just going to knock their socks off I think the first thing I would focus on is the fact that most Cremants are made exactly the same as Champagne. Whether the same varietals or not, they're generally fermented in the bottle, which you know is, is more expensive, more time consuming, but generally produces a more rich and more balanced wine. Uh, in the case of a Cremant uh, de Jura or a Cremant de Bourgogne, they're coming from areas that are known for Chardonnay and Pinot Noir, and those are two of the primary grapes in Champagne. In the case of Cremant de Jura, Jura is very, very, very small and shrinking mm -hmm. in a lot of cases. So where Champagne is getting larger, the more area they're allowed to grow uh, what qualifies to be Champagne, the Jura is always going to be small, it's going to be rare, and that in itself generally adds an air of importance and excitement to, to having a bottle of bubbly, the fact that there's very little of it. Yeah, so being able to grab this bottle and tell your guests, like, only 13% of these bottles actually get exported globally. So like very rare, very scarce. So, I mean, if I saw anyone walk in with a bottle from Jura at a party, I would immediately tackle them. I'd be, yeah, extremely excited. This is the kind of wine that if, you know, people who know, 
they very know. Exciting. And now you know. And now you know, yeah. So thank you so much for joining us. As always, our in-house and in-pool shirtless <laughs> sommelier, Andrew Stewart from Vino Alvino. And I guess we'll see you next time. We'll see you next time.